and start a new one, and we'll dive right into section 1.2. And 1.2, if I were to summarize it, again, some of, some of these early sections are kind of smorgasbords, but if I were to summarize 1.2, It's using functions to create new functions. And we can do this in a number of ways. I guess from one point of view, you could say there are five ways to do this, but that makes this material sound much more formidable than it is because four of them are just arithmetic. We can add functions and subtract them and multiply them and divide them. So, you know, if f of x, X equals x squared and g of x is x minus one. We can create new functions from these arithmetically. And this is done in the very natural way. Maybe the only sort of thing that's not obvious is the notation. Um, but even that, I mean, on the left, we have a function named f, we have a function named g. We add them together. So what do we name our new function? f plus g. And this addition is done in the natural way. And, you know, you, you want to be a little careful with subtraction. Because if you've got negative signs, they'll cancel each other out x squared minus x minus 1 is x squared minus x plus 1. This, this negative sign goes in front of the x, but it also goes in front of the negative 1. We don't normally bother writing any kind of multiplication symbol when we're multiplying functions. We'll just say fg. And again, you want to be a little careful here. Um, we're multiplying the entirety of the first function by the entirety of the second function. If we multiply that out, x cubed minus x squared. And division. Outside of, you know, elementary school or wherever, we don't tend to use the division symbol, the, you know, dash with the dots. We normally just write division as a fraction, something over something. And, um, we're in a sense, 
it's going to use this material practically every day in the calculus. Um, what we're really going to need to be able to do, and I, I don't think it's too formidable with arithmetic, we're less interested in doing it than we are in recognizing that it's happening. So if we see a function x squared plus x divided by 2x minus 4, we need to be able to look at this and we need to be able to say, well, in a sense, there's a bunch of stuff happening here. We've got a square and we've got a plus and we've got a two times and we've got subtraction. But what we really have here is something divided by something else. And this is because of how calculus is done. Um, when we get into chapter three, we're going to build up a series of rules. So, you know, we'll learn how to, how to do a calculus this with x squared, and we'll learn how to do a calculus with 2x, and all of those things. And in particular, we'll learn a series of rules for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So we'll learn how to do a calculus with x squared plus x, and we'll learn how to do a calculus with 2x minus 4. And then we'll learn a rule that will let us do a calculus with the product of two functions. Well, to use that product, product, quotient. Well, to use that quotient rule, we need to be able to look at that and say, yeah, that's what this is. This is a quotient. It's no use having a quotient rule if we can't recognize quotients. It's no use having a product rule if we can't recognize products. So, you know, this is not something people traditionally struggle hugely with. So it's not something I'll spend a huge amount of time on. But I mean, if H of X is as I have written it, I mean, we've got a bunch of stuff there. I mean, we've got a square, we've got a trig function, but in terms of arithmetic, what's happening here? If you were asked to summarize this in a word. There are only four things you could guess. Um, I promise I won't make fun of you. Does this look like addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division? <laughs> multiplication. And I mean, it can be a little tricky because we've obviously got other stuff here, right? We, you do see addition, you do see subtraction, but that's all in the parentheses. What you, we have fundamentally is this thing and that thing being multiplied together. So if we when we're if we're called upon to do calculus with something like this, we'll use the multiplication. 
And, you know, if you didn't find the answer to that question obvious, it's, it's hard to know sometimes whether students are struggling or whether they just don't want to talk to me. But if you did struggle with that, it's fine. We'll introduce this stuff gradually so you'll get practice as we go. Um, the, the trickier one, uh, probably I shouldn't use words like that, but but it's true. The other way that we can take functions and combine them together is called composition. And the really quick and dirty and informal way of explaining composition is that it's sticking a function inside another function. And composition is done the same way any function evaluation is done. So we're not going to be learning new rules to do composition, by which I mean, you know, suppose f of x is x squared minus x plus 3. We could evaluate f. We could evaluate f of 2. 2 squared minus 2 plus 3 is whatever it is. 4 minus 2 is 2 plus 3 is 5. Or we could evaluate f of negative four. Negative four squared minus negative four plus three. Notice that I'm being careful with parentheses here. Negative four squared is going to be positive 16 minus negative four is going to be plus four and then plus three is not 20. Sometimes I just write things and I don't know why. It's going to be 23. Well, now say that we have a second function, g of x equals x minus 2. Well, just like we can find f of 2 and f of negative 4, we can find f of g of x. And it's done in precisely the same way. G of x squared minus G of x plus 3. And then I wish I could make that bar be a little less conspicuous. But then, just like with negative four, we were very careful with parentheses. We're squaring all of x minus two. We're subtracting all of x minus two. And then we're adding three. And 
We could, if we wanted to, you know, simplify that. Um, we could FOIL it out and then combine like terms, but that's not really the point of this lesson. The point of this lesson is to be able to see that we have two functions and just as we can with numbers, just like we can stick two in F, just like we can stick negative four in F, we can stick another function in F. And that's called composition, you know. If, I wish we had a little more space, but if h of x were the sine of x, then f of h of x would be the sine of x squared minus the sine of x plus three. And similarly, really running out of space here, but that's, uh, this composition could be done in the other order. I mean, just like we can stick H into F, we could stick F into H. So H is the sign of X. We're sticking F of X in there. So that's the sign of x squared minus x plus three. And we can see from these examples that composition is like subtraction and division in the sense that order matters. If you're taking the composition of two functions, h of f of x, and f of h of x are not the same thing. <laughs> um, where, where this tends to cause issues for students is, I mean, just like addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division, just like arithmetic, we're not so much interested in doing composition in this class as recognizing composition when it happens. And students tend to find this trickier because there is no composition symbol. I mean, you can recognize addition, you'll see a plus symbol. When there's division, you'll see the division bar. There's no composition symbol here. I mean, we have subtraction, a square, subtraction, subtraction, addition. So it tends to be less, um, less clear when composition is occurring. But there are some guidelines, I would say, that make it um, feasible to recognize composition most of the time. Um, first, let's get a little terminology down. When we have two functions being composed, we call one of them the inside function and the other the outside function. And this terminology is extremely literal. You see these parentheses. Well, one of the functions is inside the parentheses and the other function is outside the parentheses.
And with the exception of exponents, exponential functions, e to the x, which we'll talk about down the line, you're going to recognize composition. You'll see parentheses, and you'll have one function inside the parentheses, and you'll have the other function outside of the parentheses. And the inside function will be inside, and the outside function will be outside. So the sine of x squared minus x plus 4. You see we have a sine function. And you see that we have a quadratic function. And when we write the sine function, you see we have parentheses enclosing whatever is inside the sine. And now our inside function and our outside function are going to be, again, extremely literal. The outside function is the sine function, the sine of x. The inside function is the function inside the parentheses, x squared minus x plus 4. Another thing that's going to make it easier to recognize inside and outside functions is that we're just going to see the same patterns repeat over and over again. Because, I mean, when you think of it, we don't actually have that many functions. It's like, we have... Again and again and again, we're going to see the pattern that we saw on the last frame, where we have one of our six trig functions, and then in parentheses, we have something else. And whether it's the tangent of x squared or the secant of the natural logarithm or the cotangent of e to the x or the cosine of x squared minus x plus 4, it's always going to be the same pattern. We have these parentheses. And the trig function outside the parentheses will be the outside function. And the something inside the parentheses will be the inside function. So eventually, this is going to become automatic. And I understand, you know, there's in education, I mean, I think there's a very natural response to the, to the concept of busy work. The, the idea that professors give students homework just because they think they should, I guess, or just for the heck of it, but at least, in regards to these. I mean, just doing the problems really is 
a necessary part of the learning process. I mean, if you think this is a little confusing, well, by the time you've done the 20th problem, you will no longer think it's confusing. So I know it's not fun, but we do have a reason for it. Um, the other pattern that we're going to see right away not right away. We're actually going to take an extremely lengthy detour into the land of limits, but another pattern that we're going to see once we reach chapter three is when we have functions raised to powers. So for example, h of x is x squared minus 2x plus 7, 7 raised to the fourth power. And again, this is an our inside outside terminology continues to be extremely literal. We have a function inside parentheses. And outside of the parentheses is a four power, so a power function, in other words. So the outside is the power function, x to the four. And that brings us to the end of 1.2 and to the end of class all at once. So Thursday, we'll briefly review the trig functions. Um, you, of course, can teach an entire class on those. We do um, math one, three, four trigonometry, but a lot of that we're not going to need. So if, if trade functions were a while ago, you saw them in high school and don't remember all of those identities your teacher told you to memorize, that's fine. We're just going to briefly remind ourselves of the definitions, and we're going to make sure we have one of those identities down. And I will see you then. Uh, remember 8 a.m.